get notifications, and stay updated every time I post a challenge podcast by hitting the subscribe button. Thank you all, and hope you enjoy. People, I got a very special guest joining me today. You might know him well, uh, Mr. Beautiful. What's going on, Kenny? How you guys doing? Um, pretty good. You know, I can't complain. And as good as you can be in this uh, shitty world we're living in right now. Yeah, you know, we're not too far from each other. You know, I know you grew up in Jersey, so uh, we kind of in the beginning of this, it was a little bit of an adjustment for sure. I know you've got uh, your own gym that you're running and stuff. How was uh, how was the adjustment with that? Uh, well, right before all this happened, I had left my old gym. And uh, I was about to start a new one. And thank God I didn't sign the lease on the place because I'd be looking down the barrel of a pretty hefty gun right now because of all that. So it's good it didn't happen. I mean, it was kind of a blessing in disguise. Uh, The gym industry, they're just ruining it right now because it was already difficult to start a gym. And now they're even making it more complicated. Um, You know, all these new rules and regulations, it's just... uh, it's just going to make it very difficult for anybody to survive. Restaurants, bars, gyms, nightclubs, whatever it is, you know, the, the, what they're implementing and what you have to do to run the business the way they want, the economics just don't make sense. You know, you're, you're putting in du- triple the amount of effort for, you know, a quarter of the revenue. So it's not, a, it's not looking good for a lot of people. And I think we haven't even seen the uh, the the, top, the the peak of this yet. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's uh it's a shame, man, because you see with like especially gyms you just mentioned, gyms, nightclubs, all those things. Like you're talking about the people that are in charge of that, like spend their whole life like trying to build their you know sure. build their business, yeah. and then all it takes is like a month or two for it to all crumble. Yeah, it's sad because. Um, You're seeing people, I know people who have been in business 10, 12, 15, 20 years who are just like packing it in, you know, and this is their livelihood, this is their career. And I'm like, what are you going to do? They're like, I don't know. So there's going to be a lot of scenarios and a lot of situations where people, you know, who spent their their whole life doing one thing just don't have anywhere to turn and, and nowhere to go. I mean, obviously there will become other opportunities and other situations may come up where they they'll find success hopefully but for the most part i think we're all going to struggle for a couple months now a couple years even yeah the um actually the retro fitness in my town closed um in june they shut down yeah yeah well they just declared bankruptcy oh wow as a company so yeah so you're you're going to see a ton of that you know there's going to be a lot of people who are just like you know just have nowhere else to go and nothing else to do and that's it so. But yeah, no, I want to talk about um, your CrossFit a little bit though. Like, when did you, uh, when did that kind of become like a staple of um, basically like what you do? Like, was that something t- that tied into when you were doing the challenges, or was it kind of after the fact that you started yeah. getting really into it? Yeah. So when I was on the challenge, I graduated college in '05. I did my first show in '05, um, and when I did my first show, I was like, okay, I got to get in TV shape. I got to get ready for this so i started finding different trainers and different forms of working out Uh, i started doing endurance training i was boxing i was doing judo um i wrestled all through high school and college but i was like i I just want to do everything and that's how i discovered crossfit in this constant search i had a couple trainers uh my buddy jeff vittori he was a trainer out in um, cedar grove new jersey and i started working with him that's when I first, this is 2005, 2006, we started flipping tires, hitting the tires with sledgehammers, pulling sleds, you know, doing all that shit, bear crawls. Um, so I started doing that stuff pretty early on, you know, and then I'd go on the show and start doing it. And that kind of evolved into my old fitness career. Yeah, you, you mentioned about, um, you know, graduating in 05 i think uh it's time to drop the little fun fact for the audience so anybody who's been a kind of listener of what's been going on with what i've been saying i've alluded to my school a couple times fun fact ladies and gentlemen the school that i'm currently now going to is actually the one that uh kenny graduated from so small world (laughs) yeah yeah i was it was definitely a different campus back then uh it's funny because 
when I went there, the claim to fame was that Bruce Willis went there. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, he was an acting uh, major, you know, theater major at Montclair State. And it was a small school. You know, we had the, do you guys still have the diner there? The Red Hawk Diner? Yeah. Yeah. So they had just put that up when I was there. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, it's funny to see how it evolved because my family still lives over that way. And I pass by there sometimes. And it's, it's funny to me how many new buildings there are and how beautiful the campus is and stuff. And it just gradually grew, grew, grew. I graduated there in 05. My sister graduated in 09, I think. And that four-year gap, it just blew up. You know, there was a ton of new buildings. There was a ton of construction going on. Um, so it's funny to see how fast that campus grew. Yeah, it's, um, I think we're like the second largest campus in um, New Jersey. Is it really? Wow. Yeah. yeah that yeah. definitely was through 15 years ago. <laughs> yeah, my, my, uh, I'm a communication major, so they just opened or started like the building and communications, like, which is um, the school that I got to get into for my uh, major, obviously. So they just started that, like, I think a few years ago. So that's like pretty wild. No shit. Now that you- Dude, the best thing you guys had was that Six Brothers Diner that's gone now, right? Yeah, dude. The food there, is sh- the food there is so shitty, dude. Like, oh, God. oh my God. That, I don't know. If, the only yeah. thing that was open all night. Now we used to go there all the time. It's like when you're drunk, shitty food is the best food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they um, they got this. I don't know if it was around when you were there. Did you guys have Sam's Place back when you were there? No. Sam's Place. No. What's that? That's like the um. That's like kind of like the main food uh food dining room where um. It's like connected to like the biggest um dorm building like campus. Machuga no, Heights. No. Yeah. And the we food didn't. is like yeah. The food's disgusting. Everyone's <laughs> everyone complains about it. Yeah. It's like no bad. shit. Yeah. No, I rarely ate on campus. You know, when I was going to college, uh, and wrestling, and you know. I was super into bodybuilding and shit. So I would go home and eat like just a can of tuna, like tuna right out of the can or like egg whites and shit. So you really couldn't get a lot of that stuff there. Uh, yeah. Doing a lot of that. I didn't really eat on campus much. And I don't, aside from the Red Hawk Diner and the, and the, um, you know, Six Brothers Diner, there was really nothing else there. Yeah, you're telling me. But um, you also mentioned about being a wrestler, so I'd assume you uh, have either watched or do watch WWE. <laughs> That's why I started wrestling in high school and college, because I watched too much WWE. Yeah, me uh, too, actually. I wrestled when I was younger. Um, yeah. <laughs> when I got there, it wasn't, it wasn't what I saw on TV, though. And I think a lot no. of people, <laughs> a lot of people yeah. who watch and then try to make that transition will, will realize it best. I was definitely uh, disappointed when I knew I couldn't fucking dress up like Ric Flair and you know, buy him somebody for sure. Um, but I fell in love with the sport. I loved it. And, um, you know, I, I still do some jujitsu and stuff like that now. Um, so it's still fun. I love the idea of the competition. Uh, it obviously made me a better athlete. Uh, I think the, the level of discipline that comes with wrestling, I love being a part of a team. But everything you do is individual, so I love that aspect of it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's taught me a lot. I enjoyed it. Um, but yeah, the uh, the WWE stuff. I mean, I'm I'm still a huge fan. Like not the new shit. I don't watch any of the new stuff. But I'll watch a network or I'll watch YouTube and watch old wrestling videos. I like the Iron Sheik and Hulk Hogan, and Ultimate Warrior, shit like that. Like I'd say like 85 to 90 six were like the best years for wrestling yeah they, they've they been on like a downhill uh trajectory in the last couple of years yeah it's 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 been so bad oh, sorry i lost her um it's been so bad like i can't even watch the new stuff there's so there's there's good talent it's just the way they the organization is run now everything i think it's just society it's like everything's got to, during the 90s was that like attitude error um properly named for it uh they had just these over-the-top personalities and they kind of let them do what they wanted to do and um you know 
nowadays, it's like you can't get away with any of that shit. You know, the stuff that went on in the 90s, it's like people would be banned for now. Yeah, dude, uh, D- Dolph Ziggler, dude, that, that that's one name that you mentioned about. Um, I don't know if you know who, you know who Dolph Ziggler is? I know who he is, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's a big CrossFitter, too, if I'm if I'm right. Um, he's You just mentioned about, um, like, talent and stuff. He's someone that's, like, really miss, like, like underutilized. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. I feel like him, that guy Morrison. <laughs> yeah, you t- you, yeah, I was just talking about um, him the other day, actually. It's crazy you just mentioned that. Yeah, um, I, I think, that, like, I think some of these guys are, so, like, some of them are great. I like Seth Rollins. I like, uh, um, who else? Um, what's the big guy with the beard? Strowman, Braun Strowman. Braun Strowman. Like some of these guys, it's like you should just kind of let them at it, you know, and just let them cut their own promos and interviews and shit. Because that's what made, you know, there's a lot of people who compare them. I was watching an interview with like Stone Cold the other day and he was, he was kind of shitting on a lot of these new guys, but at the same time be like, you know, they're not allowed really to say what they want to say and do some of the shit that the, the other guys did, you know? Uh, and I think if they were allowed to, you'd probably see a lot more talent coming up and a lot cooler shit happening in the world of wrestling. If they were allowed to do their own shit. No. Yeah, for, for sure. Um, but yeah, let's uh, let's jump now into uh, what everybody's pretty much looking at here. Um, yeah. So I want to start kind of like with your casting story, but I have it under pretty good authority, and I've heard from you multiple times on like other podcasts and whatnot that you were actually um, supposed to be on or almost ended up on Real World Austin, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I yeah. kind of ask like um, people who were on Fresh Meat if they would have rather gone through the whole real world process instead of going on to the challenge. So could you maybe walk me through your casting story? And then from there, tell me if you would have rather have been on the real world at first before the challenge. Yeah. So, um, I was supposed to be on real world Austin and film in the spring of five. And had I not, uh, thank God I didn't get on the show because I would have left in January of 05 and I probably would have never finished college. You know, that was my, that was the spring semester of my senior year and I would have probably never finished because I would have been filming for three, four months and then never, uh, never gotten a chance. Would it be, if, would it be cool to have done a real world for sure? Um, but, uh, you know, looking back on my life, I'm like, ah, it was probably the best thing to happen that I didn't do it. Uh, Cause then I would have had to go back to school at 30 something to finally finish a semester of college. Um, and I, you know, I'm glad I didn't have to do that. Uh, and then when I got on television, you know, kind of, I, I really thought I was just going to be a one and done. I thought I was going to do one season and, you know, kind of move on with my life. And, you know, coming out of college, I actually, the one regret I have in life, um, is I, I never served in the military. You know, I I wish I would have done that. And that was kind of my plan after college do about six to 10 years in the military and, you know, kind of move on from there. And I'm sure my life would have been remarkably different. Um, but they had ended up calling me back. So I was a finalist for Austin. I didn't get on Austin. Then they called me back in May of 05 and they were like, Hey, would you want to do this new show? We're going to do a real world key west and we're going to start filming in the in the uh fall and i go isn't that hurricane season in key west and they're like yeah that's what i think will make it exciting and blah blah i'm like no i'm all right i'm cool so i kind of turned down i turned down key west basically um i had a girlfriend at the time i just started this job so i didn't want to uh i didn't want to ruin all that uh and then they called me back and they in June or July of 05. And they were like, hey, we got this challenge. There's an opportunity to win $250,000, blah, blah, blah. And now here I am. I'm coming out of college. I'm, I'm in pretty good shape. I'm a you know, D3 athlete. Um, I'm like, God, unless some D1 football player or something shows up, I, I think I got a pretty good shot of fucking winning this thing. So, uh, so I, I went on, I ended up taking second place 
you know, which was pretty good. I should have won, but we didn't figure out a puzzle. So it wasn't like my athletic ability kind of gave out. It was more of the, uh, it was more of the luck of the draw, basically, you know, kind of putting together puzzle pieces and shit. Um, so it was pretty cool. And then after that, it just kind of snowballed one show after another. I did eight, nine shows in six years, seven years. So. Yeah, that's that's crazy, man. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy how like, um, you know, you had what two opportunities to get on the you know real world and then it just went straight to the challenge and the, then it snowballed from there but would you have rather done the real world austin as opposed to going uh, straight on to the yeah challenge? like i said i mean would it have been cool to have done it yes but you know for me it probably wouldn't have been the best situation for my life because i would have never finished college so it's right. good that yeah. i didn't get on uh would i have liked to do it sure i mean you know i i'm sure would i like to do it now fuck no i'm you know, you get to a certain age and you're like, I don't want to live in a bunk bed or with 75 other people. You know, I'm like an old fucking curmudgeon now. But uh, at 21, yeah, that's amazing. So cool. You know, and Austin's a great city. I mean, I remember being 21, 22 years old and thinking Austin was a cool city. It's now even cooler. Like, I love all I was just in Austin like two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Wow. Yeah. Pretty gnarly. But um, we referred to your wrestling and wrestling in general quite a bit. And the big thing um, was the wrestling match with you and CT. Could you maybe talk to me a little bit about what really went down? Because there's been mixed things I've heard, like of who, what really happened. I've actually heard some things that you actually won. But what the editing and what we actually saw showed, um, you know, it tried to make it look like he kind of won. Could you maybe talk to me about that? Yeah, they show it. The timeline was weird. Uh, the way they put it on TV. But what happened was, you know, I mean, he was always a dick to people. And he'd come on the show and he's fucking coked out of his brain, all hopped up on shit. Uh, And uh, so he was being a dickhead. And we were rolling around and I like threw him to the ground and he got pissed. Like he was one of those guys who had this image that he, he felt he had to uphold. So after I did that, he came up behind me and choked me. So that's when we went outside. And when we went outside and he's like, oh, I'm going to hit you. I'm going to hit I go, dude, you go ahead. Hit me. And, you know, when he went to go hit me, I like double legged him to his back, threw him down. And then when he was, while I had him down, I like shoved his face into the ground. And that's when his nose started bleeding and shit. And that's when he fucking went berserk. But they didn't show that, right? I have I have pictures of it. There's I'm sure there's video of it. I mean, some of the, they have all the raw footage and shit. But I have I have a picture of you know kind of me holding him down. Somebody had sent it to me. I don't even know. Like years ago, somebody had sent it to me. I think somebody on the cast took the picture. Um, and he, uh, you know, he got fucking living. And that's right after that. That's it when he hit Davis, and then they ended up sending him home. Um, you know, we, we we got into it a couple times, me and him. Um, that was the only t- time it got pretty physical. Um, but, but, yeah, that was like my third show. So, you know, and after that, everybody was like, oh, dude, you, you know how to wrestle pretty good. I'm like, yeah, I've fucking been doing it most of my life at that point. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's what happened. It was, uh, it was pretty... Uh, pretty crazy how it, it just snow it, it kind of just like went ape shit we were all just hanging out and then he was kind of getting all fired up and shit and uh i this we were in like the living room and i fucking threw him to his back you know um and that's when he came up behind me and like choked like he li- i was standing there talking to somebody they were like yo 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 and he like came up and just grabbed me from behind um so and it's so of course like they always any t- they they've done a real good job of editing for that guy, you know. Um, there was a couple people who like uh, what's his name? Um, God, what the fuck was his name? He was dating Jillian. He was Pete. on. Oh Pete. no, Frank, Frank. No, no, no Frank, Frank Rose. I was thinking of Frank. Jill's partner. Yeah. Never we were we were on Gauntlet three, so I think that was right after the Inferno. 
or before the Inferno. I forget what it was. But we were on Gauntlet 3, and, you know, him and Pete got into it. Uh, Frank got into it. And Frank fucking just was up in his fucking face, and CT wanted no part about it. And they were filming this, and I'm like, oh, my God, people are going to see what a fucking bitch this guy is when after uh, after they air this. And they never aired it, you know? And there are so many other times, it's like, I mean, Johnny's fucking punked him out a bunch of times. You know, Wes, like, they they only show the footage of him just being a fucking badass. And I'm like, I mean, I'm not taking anything away from the guy. He's definitely a fucking tough dude. He's a great athlete. I don't know how good he is now. Um, but, like, back in the day, he was definitely definitely a tough guy. But, uh, you know, he, I don't, the amount of fear and uh, bullshit that was bu- built up around him, like, no one looked at him like that. Like, I mean, some guys were like, yeah, he's fucking crazy. He's an idiot. But most of the other guys were just like, you know, when we were on the, by the time we did our last show, when we did like the, at the ruins, uh, rivals, by the time we were on rival, we were like, dude, shut the fuck up. Nobody even listened to him. You know, nobody's afraid of him. Everybody's like, just fucking get rid of him. You know, um, he was like just another guy in the house, you know? Like, and you would never cut a deal with them or anything. You know, we used to like, be like, hey, I'll get you to the end, blah, because you couldn't trust them. You know, I think there was a level of, I haven't watched the show in a while, but Johnny was telling me like, nobody fucking does that. There's no loyalty anymore. There's no uh, alliances and shit like that. He goes, it's just fucking crazy now. Um, and I, <laughs> we, we always compared it to like the mafia. Where it's like there was this golden era of the mafia where it's like, you know, they would work together and they would get shit done. And this ring of organized crime worked better than the actual fucking system. You know, uh, people respected it. And that's how it was when we were there. You know, everybody voted with us. We, You know, like nothing happened in the house without us knowing. Um, so it was pretty cool. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like after we had gone, like me, Evan and stuff. There was, uh, you know, there were there was no more of that. Or at least that's what I've heard anyway. But you know, it was a tight group. It was like it it made sense because there were certain people who come in, new people who came in. It didn't matter if you were like against our group or opposed our group. We were going to get rid of you. And the deal was always like, hey, we'll get you to the end, but we'll all fight it out at the end. Like even between me and Johnny. Like I'm like, dude, I'm going to get you to the end, but. If it's a foot race in the end, we're we're going head to head, you know. So that's what you wanted. You wanted to be able to because it made sense economically, right, or for your paycheck. If we're both going, I don't want to leave day one because that's I only get paid for one week, you know. We got paid weekly, so towards the end, it's like the longer you stayed, the more money we made. So right. we were making ten, fifteen grand a week. So I'm like, fuck, let's get to the end. You know, we're all going to make more money if we get to the end. So that's what we would do with each other. We'd help each other make as much money as possible. And then, you know, when you get to the end, let's fucking race it out. So. Right. And if there's three spots and there's three teams, now you're like, okay, you're whoever wins is obviously going to make the most money. And but you're guaranteed extra money on top of that. You know, mm-hmm. so that's what it was I, when I was on Fresh Meat 2 by myself. I told everybody, I was like, listen, if I'm here, you could rely on my vote. You could guarantee I will do exactly what I say and you'll be safe. And that's what I did the whole time. And, you know, um, it sucks that we did. I didn't win that one. I should have fucking won that one, too. Um, but, you know, we ended up taking second. But I'll take fucking 30 grand any day of the week for a week, months of work. Yeah, yeah Definitely. But do you think that's why you and Evan uh, grew so close is because you felt like you could trust them? Or what do you feel like? Um, how did that yeah, I, you there, was, I, there was a lot of us that were close. Like we were super close with uh, Paula. You know, we were su- Johanna was super close with us. Um, Susie, Johnny, Derek. You know, there was this we had this little group that uh, obese. um you know, people knew if we were there, we're like, you could, you could trust what we were going to say and trust what we were going to do. And we were some of the better athletes in the house. And, um, I mean, Evan is ridiculously smart. You know, Johnny's ridiculously savvy, but like when we were on shows together, like I did the Island with Johnny, 
you know, and we fucking, we made sure we controlled every vote. We controlled every move. You know, we controlled the flow of food. It was, it was very mafia esque. But yeah, now I kind of want to shift into the Island though, since we just brought it up. Could you maybe talk to me about your experience on the Island in the sense of like how miserable it actually was? Oh, for sure. I mean, I'd say the only other miserable time in my life is right now in 2020, but, uh, it sucks pretty bad. We were, um, you know, we, I lost 30 pounds in a month. You know, you, when you're, when you're eating four or 500 calories a day, you know, you're, you have zero energy, you're depleted, you feel it terrible. You have no energy to do anything. You don't even want to get out of bed. Um, so it was pretty bad. I mean, we had to kind of fend for ourselves if we wanted extra food. Um, you know, you had to hunt it or figure it the fuck out. And that's never what we really signed up for, right? Like every other show, you know, there was craft services everywhere, and, you know, f- food and shit in the house all, all the time. If you wanted to drink, you could drink your fucking face off. You know, there was booze all the time. Like night one, we're drinking rum out of the bottle on this island, you know? Uh, by the third, fourth week, you're like, dude, I don't want to touch alcohol because you smell it and you're fucking drunk. Cause that's how, yeah. So I, I went from like maybe 190 on that show to 160. I was, I was losing a pound a day. It was crazy. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. They, this past season, they just had them, uh, living in a bunker in Czech Republic. Which, I mean, by comparison, I mean, the people were cl- complaining and uh, bitching and moaning on this last season. But shit, if they had to go through what you went through on the island, fuck, I mean. Fuck. Yeah, it was funny to see who who broke, you know. There was obviously times where everybody wanted to kind of throw in the towel and leave. Um, me being one of those people, for sure. Uh, but you kind of waited out. and It was definitely worth the wait. I mean, we end up winning. Seventy-five thousand dollars, and I'm sure you've heard all the stories. It's like, oh, you guys screwed over Paul, and it's like, I'll fucking talk about that on my deathbed. That people say we screwed her over. The deal was that we were going to guarantee the win, and everybody on our boat was going to throw her five grand. I'm the only fucking idiot on the boat who gave her money, um, but at the same time, it's, you know that was the plan. We knew if we were like, if it was me, Derek, Johnny, and uh, Evelyn, we could do anything, right? We weren't sure what the final was. You know, it was like sail to the end, and that's all it was. But we we didn't know that till the last day. You know, we were like, oh, if we get to that island, do we have to climb? Do we have to fucking dig? Do we have to do something? So we were like, all right, let's just stack this team and get all the best people. You know, Evelyn was like a fucking CrossFit girl. She could run and climb and swim and do everything that the fucking guy better than the guys could and Derek's obviously a great competitor Johnny's a great competitor so we're like all right the four of us are on the same team and we got to split the money four ways let's just fucking get it done this way you know and it was never in the plan Paula was like yes she was a part of our alliance like we said we'll get you to the end you know and we even made went a step further and we're like hey we'll even give you some of our money make sure your votes go our way and we'll take care of you she made it to the end. She, no, she never even had to go in an elimination. We gave her a fucking key. Like, that's how fucking crazy the politics were. You didn't even have to go get your fucking, your key to the final. We were we were giving them away. We'd be like, all right, she's gone, give it to her. This one's gone, go give it to this. Like, that's how we ran it. And the the production team, I think some of them loved it because they were like, oh, we're, you're, they're watching this fucking corrupt system, this, you know, uh, petri dish of fucking society come alive um and then others were like no this is not how we plan the game it's like all right well fuck off you know so yeah she seemed to be putting on the waterworks a little bit maybe for the camera if she yeah, uh, I mean, she did a lot of that i mean there was a ton of, i mean you, you can't forget the fact that you're on television right or these people are on television we're all on television and people are fucking turning up their personalities you know, like we were talking about before with CT, I've been with him on bar appearances and events, and he can't be a fucking nicer guy, super chilled out, you know, and then he's on the show and he's just completely different. Like he would text me before shows and be like, oh, dude, we'll do this. We'll do that. Like 
couldn't have been a nicer. I felt like I wasn't even talking to him. And then you get on the show and he's the character you see. And there was a ton of people like that, you know, um, anybody who's ever like taken one of my classes or knows me outside the show is like, you're the exact same person. You know, you joke around, you fucking like to, you know, I, I, I don't really have multiple personalities. Whereas like, there's some people where you never know what version of them you're going to get. And I take a lot of heat for making fun of people and shit, but, um, you know, when you're fucking bored sitting in a house for four or five weeks on end, you know, everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing it. They just, you know, if you're doing it to me, I'm doing it to you and we're both laughing about it. And then you go and cry in a closet or cry to a producer. It's like, one, are you doing that for the attention aspect? And then two, if they only play the scenes of me saying shit to you, then it makes me look like the villain. Because people are like, well, we never saw them do that. And say, I know you never saw it, but it happened. (laughs) You know? (laughs) It's all fucking editing. So Yeah. But this story has been told a couple times on here, but I want to hear your side of the spectrum with the whole island. Because Abram told a story about how he dressed up in a ninja suit and kind of did like a little... uh, crawl and stole a bunch of hot dogs and eggs and all that kind of stuff but yeah um, so well we we noticed that i mean he didn't even tell us at first he had went out one night and broke into the production room and stole a bunch of food and it was probably three or four days later we're like dude where'd you get ketchup and he's like the other night i broke in blah 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 so that night it was raining really bad and Johnny's like we're gonna go get it so we're gonna do the same thing so I kind of did look out Johnny ran so in the story will never do it justice because it was this 20 foot high fence bamboo fence we had to dig a hole underneath right because we didn't want to put any holes in the fence we had to dig a hole underneath and it was this fucking football field to the production room of like swampland, like knee high, fucking snake infested, shitty water in the middle of a jungle. We were in the, uh, we were in uh, Focus del Toro, Panama, right? And after we, after we got caught and we got in trouble for it, they were like, do you know how dangerous what you guys did was? They were like, there's big cats back there and all types of shit. So, but when we went, so Johnny went the first time, goes and gets like a Rubbermaid, like a giant Rubbermaid full of like lettuce and bullshit. And I go, dude, why didn't you even open this up and see what the fuck was in here? He goes, I didn't even think of it. So I went back with it. So the two of us went. So now we didn't even have a lookout guy. We just both went and we just fucking raided the whole place. We took so much shit, plates of brownies hot dogs, eggs. We were taking shit we couldn't even fucking make. You know? <laughs> we're, and because it's like two weeks in, you're now basically starving at this point. Um, so we stole all this shit and we were like, there was nowhere to hide it because there's cameras everywhere. So we're like putting it in our pillows. We're putting it in our suitcase. We're taping it underneath the bunks of the, uh, of the beds and the, the palapas that we were in. Um, so it was it was funny. And then we were coming back from one of the challenges and the executive producer had all our shit laid out on a table. And he goes, does this stuff belong to you guys? I go, I've never seen any of that. Never seen any of that. And they ended up finding us. And they find us both, me and Johnny, $7,500 a piece. Wow. It's the most expensive bottle of ketchup I've ever bought. Yeah, you guys took the fall for everybody, I heard, right? Yeah, yeah. So we took, uh, I mean, it's not the first time or the last time on that show that we kind of fucking, we were, and we, I'll tell you what, we weren't eating all that shit ourselves. We shared it with everybody, you know, and it was, uh, it was kind of the thing. We, we would like help each other out. We'd help other people. We were throwing fucking bags of pasta and stuff in our rice and like divvying out shit. We were going to get it. We were stealing it. We were taking the risk. We were hiding the shit, and we were just giving it to people. 
you know, and you never see that side of it. Um, but it is what it is at this point. Yeah. But now those two names, Abe and Johnny, I kind of want to stay on the topic of because we know how history's played out now with Johnny and who he is and how much he's, uh, you know, meant to the show's history. But a big hypothetical question that a lot of people, you know, think about from time to time is during that face off um, when they had the vote who was going home between Abe and Johnny, Abe outwardly told everybody, like, look, I, I got to go home. I got work to do. Like, please vote me off. Yet Johnny was actually almost voted off um, yeah. still on the same token. So basically my hypothetical to you is had Abe not said what he said or maybe just in general people decided they liked him better and decided to keep him, how would that have changed things? In, uh, we, are, you know? we already had dis- – hold on one second, hold on. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we were, I mean, def- Johnny was definitely hated. I mean, he was, he's always been relentless. I think now people accept it and love him for it. Um, and he's become like the biggest villain on fucking that show. Uh, but <clears throat> Jesus Christ, hold on. Um, sorry about that. It's my brother who's coming into the city. Um, so yeah, so Johnny, you know, they kind of became the beloved villain of the show. Um, but, uh, you know, at the time it was very hated and Abe had already been like, Hey, listen, I'm going home. I need to go home. He had some personal shit he was dealing with. He's like, what do you want me to do? I was like, give Johnny your key. Like your, he had a key at the time. He had to give it to somebody. I forget who he gave it to, but we were like, do this Dunbar. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we were like, just give me your key, you know, and we're, we'll take care of everything else. And we were, we were just friends and that's kind of how we did shit. Like we worked together, me and Abe worked together on the, uh, on the Inferno and stuff. So we had a history and, you know, you always want to say like, if some, somebody's going to win and you rather it be one of your friends than some fucking random idiot, you know? So, and that's kind of how we played the game. Was Abe supposed to be on that uh, boat originally with you guys before he? Yeah. Him? So Abe was one of the one of the guys who was who would have potentially had he have stayed the whole time. Yeah. You know I don't know how it would have shook shook down at the end, but yeah, it would have probably been like me, Abe, Johnny, and Derek. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, but what do you think about how Johnny's evolved since? I mean, it's fucking impressive, dude. It's pretty impressive. Um, you know. Um, if it could be anybody, I'm glad it's him. You know, like I said, I'm glad to, I'm happy to see my friend win. Uh, you know, and he, he's always loved the show more than anybody else. You know, he, he ate, slept and breathed the challenge. You know, everything he did was about the challenge. He would get very upset if we were out somewhere and people didn't know who we were. Like he, that was his, that's his identity. That's who he is. And he's owned it and he's earned it. And he's, done a really good job of it and he's made a very fucking good living for himself with it so you know kudos to him um you know you can't he's made it to the point where you can't even deny that he's the best you know he's won seven times he's he does more than anybody else he surpassed everyone so you know I, i'm happy to see him evolve and become you know the fucking the, the figurehead of the show Right. But now I want to ask you about a situation between two cast members that got into a fight that you were present in the room for. And I want to ask if you maybe thought that you could have done a better job of uh, preventing the Brad and Darrell fight. Uh, We saw that boiling over for some time. You know, they would kind of get into it every once in a while. Um, And, you know, that night, we, I didn't think... Because Darrell had just won, you know, and he had just earned his spot in the final. And we were all, like, just bullshitting about, all right, we're all going to the final. This is going to be fun, blah, blah, blah. And there was, like, one elimination left. And he was kind of sitting pretty. And 
Brad just got, I don't know why he got so fucked up that night. I mean, they both did. They both got so drunk. But no one saw that coming. You know, like, I didn't think they'd hit each other. I mean, these are, here's two guys I've done three or four shows with. You know, I've been around a hundred times. Uh, you know, I've done gigs with these guys and I've done shows with these guys and stuff. And, you know, I still talk to Durrell every once in a while. We were talking like a month or so ago. Um, did I, it was very out of character for him to hit him. You know, um, I would have never thought that. So when Brad was fucking being stupid with him and he wasn't, he didn't kick him hard. He wasn't trying, like, I think Brad was just drunk and being fucking stupid. And he kind of like bullshit kicked him and, Darrell just got up and hit him like no one saw it coming. These are like guys we we would sit in that fucking room and bullshit every night, you know, and drink and hang out. Like this was this was an every night occurrence, all the time, and we were all like buddies, you know, like you're living with these people. Nobody's hitting each other, um, and for for him to beat the shit out of him like he did, we were all like, oh shit, because as soon as he got on top of him, we jumped in and we were like, yo chill the fuck out like where the hell did that come from like no one even saw it coming so yeah but that obviously kind of uh you know kicked the rail out of the game and every show that he did uh up to that point he had won do you guys think you would have um held your word with keeping him out of uh every elimination going forward and sending him straight to the final yeah yeah we would have um he's he's definitely we would have just had to split it another way. Like that was the thing. We had one more guy left. I think, um, yeah, because it would, Brad had it. We would have had to take out Brad, right? There would have been another just elimination. Brad and Dunbar. Yeah. And Dunbar. And, you know, we were like, all right, somebody's got to go in against both these guys. You know, And you never know what game you're going to get, right? Like if you knew one of the games or you knew all the games, you're like, oh, okay, if I get this, I could win. Um, you know, you never know what game you're going to get. So it's always a risk going in. Uh, so for us, it was just like, all right, you know, he's he's earned his spot. He's won. He, he did it, what he had to do. And we would definitely honor that. I mean, even Derek. Derek will be the first one to tell you because me, Johnny, and Evan were really close. And Derek was always like the fourth man on our totem pole. Um, and Derek was like, yo, he had already gone in or some, some deal we made with him. We're like, yo, listen, Derek doesn't have to go in. Johnny's got to go in. And Johnny sacked up and fucking went in against Dunbar and beat him. You know, so, again, that's why Johnny's the best player on the fucking team. You know, he's won so many times. He's When he's got to go in, like, that was the thing. Like, when we got to go in, we got to go in, you know. Uh, And I think that that side of our whole fucking kind of group and shit, that story kind of never gets told. It's like it, they were, oh, they were assholes. They picked on everybody, blah blah blah. But there was, there was definitely some honor amongst the thieves, if you will. Mm. Yeah, we just mentioned Dunbar. There was uh, an on-air altercation between you guys during the uh, whole rope swinging challenge. Could you maybe talk to me about that and maybe your thoughts on Dunbar? Yeah, I again, like we were kind of, you know, we'd always break his balls and joke around and stuff and. Again, he was one of the guys who'd always be hanging out with us. Um, so when they lost that challenge, he lost his shit, and he was all pissed off about it. And we were, because we were all sitting below, joking around, like just fucking, you know. We, when people are forty feet in the air and they're doing something stupid, you know, or like people are doing, they're playing the games. We're heckling, you know. You're trying to get in somebody's head, you know. That's the name of the game. That's what we're doing. You know, you're playing a game and we're trying to fuck with you. Um, you know, and people would do it to me all the time. They'd be like, oh, it's the guinea pigs up on the fucking rope, blah, blah. They never show that shit. It's like, I just don't let any of it bother me, right? Because as soon as you let it bother you, now it affects the way you perform and now you lose and now you're a fucking, you know, known as a loser for the rest of the time on the show. So you, you can't let that shit affect you. It's like anything else. It's like military training. There's... There's a reason why the drill sergeant screams and yells and heckles in your face. It's like, because when you're in war and you're, you know, you're doing what you have to do, you need to be focused. You need to be centered. So if somebody's going to throw you off your game just by heckling you, you're, you know, kind of weak minded. Um, so for, uh, so for us, it was, um, it was interesting to see 
how fucking crazy he got over that, over nothing. We didn't even know what the hell happened. But he lost his shit, and then he starts yelling at me, and I'm like, dude, shut the fuck up. You know? we're, we're joking around. I didn't think you were this sensitive about it. Were you cool with him, though? Yeah, yeah, we were, I guess because we were on opposite teams now, but we had just come off another show together, and we were did, you know, I would go on the road, like at that time, me and Dunbar would go and do bar appearances and shit together, and we'd be in fucking Oklahoma and Missouri and all over the fucking place together, and, you know, we were cool. We'd go drink and hang out together, and, you know, I think he ended up apologizing to me that night, being like, dude, I'm sorry, I lost my pool. I'm like... Again, people are on TV and they want to fucking show off. And if I would have just sat there and let him yell at me, then everybody would be like, oh, dumb boy, bitch you out. So I'm like, all right, now I got to fucking say something. Right. But now I kind of want to shift it to fresh me too, though. Um, so you're coming on to this season without your usual, uh, you know, group of guys that you work with. Was it, uh, you know, kind of weird feeling having to kind of run that game from uh, the ground up? in the sense of alliance-wise and politically? Yeah. I mean, it definitely, uh, de- there were definitely some fucking lonely nights there because it's good to have some people to support you around and kind of chat with and hang out with and feel like you can rely on 100%. And in that house, I had nobody. It was like me and Laurel were, she was the only fucking close friend I had. I mean, Jill, Jill became close with us and uh, obviously Paula and, you know, I knew Jen and Ryan were playing both sides of the fence. Uh, so we didn't trust anybody, you know. So I was like, if I don't win, I'm going to go in, you know. And I fought fucking tooth and nail every fucking day to win every fucking event. And, you know, go into eliminations. Like, I, in both, elim- I think we went into two eliminations. And both both of them, we fucking crushed it, you know. Uh you know, figuring out the puzzles, fucking carrying heavy weight. Like, I was doing all... I really thought I was going to win that fucking thing. That morning, getting up for that final, I was just like, it's in the bag. Yeah, I want to ask about the your thoughts on the actual house itself, because pretty much most of the people that I've had on here, most of which agree with me, at least um, I would say that Fresh Me Too house in, uh, you know, Canada was the best house that I've at least seen as a casual viewer. Was that uh, your favorite location or did you have another? um, Yeah, I would say that was 2008, 2009. That house itself was by far the best house we've ever been, that I've ever been in. Um, You know, that thing was, I think at the time they said it was like 12 or $13 million. Wow. Like a massive log cabin. The bathrooms had heated floors. It had two saunas. It was just a beautiful piece of property, like unreal. Like we got there and we're like, holy shit, this is fucking beautiful. Um, so it was everything you could possibly want. And then it's in Whistler, Canada, which is a beautiful area. That year they had the Olympics there. So. Yeah, they um, that that house, I mean, they don't really do a whole lot of cold location shows anymore. So, I mean, it was a nice uh you know, kind of change of scenery. Yeah, I, um, like I said, I mean, I really don't watch them anymore, so I don't know what, like, a lot of the other shows look like. But, yeah, for sure, at the same time, there's uh, there's definitely, um, there was some shit houses for sure, that we stayed in. Sometimes the fucking plumbing wouldn't work, and we're like, why are we here? Why are we in this shit house? So. Yeah, but um, do you think you lucked out having Laurel as a partner, though? Yeah, and, and listen, everybody's like, oh, you got lucky. I'm like, no, I, I, I'm not a fucking idiot, right? Like, when people pick partners, I even said it. I said it in my first interview. I go, everybody's like, oh, you got lucky with her. I had the third choice, third pick, right? Third guy pick, uh, right? I'm like, I've been through a final before. I've been through multiple finals before. If I'm going to run a final, I want the fucking biggest bitch possible. I want the equivalent of another man on my team, you know? And that's why I picked her. Because some of these guys are like, oh, she's cute. Oh, she's this. If you're, mass moves mass. If you're 120 pounds soaking wet, 
the fuck? You're not carrying anything. You're not helping me fucking pull anything. You know, if I have, Laurel was like 155, 160 at the time. So she had 20, 30 pounds on every other girl in the house. I'm like, she's going to fucking bulldoze these chicks. You know, most of the guys are around the same weight. Like Derek, uh, Johnny, Wes, Landon. You know, you're talking to guys who are 150 to 175, you know. CT was probably one of the heavier guys. He was like 215 maybe. Evan was like 200. I'm like 190. So we're all in and around the same weight. But the difference between a 120-pound girl and a 155-pound girl is huge. You know? Yeah. That, that's, a, that's a big, like, gap in the sense of, like, the drop-off, I felt like, between Laurel and the rest of the girls was, like, so big. I mean, although now we've, uh, you know, they've, we've seen Car and Maria go on to do great things on the show, so um, yeah. which is crazy to me because she actually went out first. Yeah, it's funny that she's become such a, a force to be reckoned with on those fucking things. <laughs> yeah. But um, now I kind of want to close with the final, though. Did you uh, kind of go into that expecting, like, you were going to win? Were you surprised that uh, Landon and Carly pulled it out? Yeah, yeah, we were, uh, you know, I think we started with a lead, or they started with a lead. I forget how it worked out. I forget the show. Um, but there was uh, it was a point, I'm like, how the fuck are they beating us? Like, I remember going up this hill on, on a mountain, and uh, we had bikes. I remember telling Laura, I go, get off the fucking bike and push the bike because we're not going to catch them trying to pedal this fucking thing. Like, just because you had to take the bike with you. So I had put mine on my bike, in my back, and I was just walking with it because to ride it up the fucking mountain, I had no idea. And Carly was by far a less competitive athlete than Laurel. But, like, you know, you, ne you never know what people's strengths and weaknesses are, like, me and Laurel, like, I know she didn't like those, um, I know she didn't like doing those, uh, like, those long-distance runs and shit. She always said, like, she hated doing that stuff. She's good in, like, small bursts, whereas I'm the exact opposite. I, I love a long-distance kind of grueling run because I, I, I could kind of dig deep a little bit more, and short bursts just aren't my thing. I'm just fucking, I don't know, I'm just not built for that shit. What was your dynamic with Landon like? Uh, we, I didn't like him in the beginning. You know, he's another guy I wrestled with, and uh, everybody's like, dude, he was a D1 wrestler. He's going to kill you. I fucking smoked him. I, wow. I, in fact, I wrestled every guy in that fucking house. And then we had to push those sleds and the, the big logs and shit. It was another challenge I crushed everybody in. Um, very happy about that. We pushed against, I'll tell you what, though. Landon made me push against him in that fucking final or in that competition. For we were pushing up against each other against this log for over an hour and a half. Wow. Yeah. And then I pushed it against Wes right afterwards and crushed him in like 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you just mentioned Wes. I mean, um, we went this long without mentioning him. So, um, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. Um, yeah. But now I kind of want to ask you now, since we never really got to, you know, see, so to speak, in an interview. <laughs> yeah. What? What was your uh, maybe stem of why you and Wes's rivalry started? I just never liked him. It was from day one. We uh, we never really got along. Um, I just thought, like, I mean, he from what I've heard, he still tells the same fucking bullshit stories about how he owns 11 companies, how he's a fucking mogul. You know, he's a shit athlete, in my opinion. Shit person, too. Um, so... He would just talk a bunch of shit and have nothing to back it up. And the fact that people listened to him was just mind-boggling to me. Mm. So. Do, do you feel like you on the on Rivals 1, thinking that you lost your mojo, was that more of you uh, kind of in your head because you had Wes as your partner? You, no. You know what it was? It was like there was definitely times where I'm like, fuck, why did I fuck that up? But there were other times where they were like, oh, you lost. And I'm like, what with the, like the crane and shit, I was like – Dude, you, he moved, like, we were both controlling, right? We both had control. So I was at work in the arm of the thing and he was driving. So one of us had to work the, uh, 
the actual treads on the machine, and the other person had to work the arm. And we swung the arm around, and we were disqualified in like 30 seconds. And I'm like, you can't really consider that a loss. You know, it was just some stupid. Um, but yeah, I mean, we kept fucking losing challenge after challenge. Um, did I feel it was my fault a little bit? For sure. But at the same time, I think it was definitely both of us. And then at the end, I mean, we really saw who was a shit bag. Yeah. But now I want to ask you, though, because on this past season, him and Johnny finally made a pact, came together, and ended up becoming friends. What do you think about that? And do you feel like their rivalry isn't as cut, uh, cutthroat as it seems? Do you think it was a lot for the show? No, I definitely know that they hate each other. Um, you know, I think they've uh, – Wes is – listen, Wes is like um, – what's his name? Like Floyd Mayweather. He knows what makes good TV, and he's willing to fucking be the villain for it. So, um, you know, kudos to him that he's he's willing to be that guy. Do, do you think it was a good thing, them working together, though? Uh, yeah, I mean, listen, if they both made some cash off it, I mean, neither of them are stupid. If they can make money off it, they'll do it. Yeah, I agree. But now, um... We're towards the end here, so I got to ask you like a big hypothetical question that a lot of people um, kind of, you know, it's like a theory that they're like kind of salty about was that on day one of the final, you and Wes beat Tyler and Johnny by over 50 minutes, and then only on day two, you only got a two minute head start. Do you feel like you guys should have got more of a head start? A hundred fucking percent. That's another one I should have won. You know, I made it to the end of seven out of eight challenges and three times I got fucked over on technicalities. So, you know, I should have had six wins after, you know, six shows, seven shows. And it's like, we lost the gauntlet because of a technicality. And I lost that because of a technicality. So there's a couple of times, I mean, I should have an extra two, three hundred thousand dollars in my fucking bank account. If it wasn't for technical fucking rules. Yeah, we're talking about if things work out a certain way. We're talking about you, at the bare minimum, maybe winning the show five times, if not six. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Trust me, nobody's more salty about it than I am. (laughs) But now I just want to ask you now in closing, what's your thoughts on the evolution of the show and them kind of bringing in from other shows like Big Brother, Survivor, and like from the UK? I think it's... uh... I think it's what we talked about, the same thing with wrestling. You know, it's like there's really not much going on, and so they're just throwing fucking shit up against the wall and hoping it sticks. I mean, I think the old model definitely worked a lot better, um, but maybe I'm just uh, old school in that way. Um, you know, it's the same thing with wrestling. It's like the, the golden age of wrestling was the best. It's like so people still watch that shit. It's like classic rock and roll. Right? It never gets old. You can watch that shit all the time. I'm still getting people being like, oh, I watched your old season. I'm like, fuck, I haven't seen any of that shit in years. But there are people who still watch it. It's like, I don't think people are going to watch these seasons. They're just, they're, they're pumping them out because there's nothing else good on television. Hey, I mean, you said it better than I could because people, uh, you know, they're pretty, uh, you know, they've been pretty vocal about wanting like old real worlders back and, um, you know, they're not incredibly happy about what's currently going on. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely, I definitely think people would want that, but after a while, you got to throw in the towel. It's like, you know, when you watch, I watch the Monday Night Raw, the 25th anniversary of Monday Night Raw, and you watch Shawn Michaels and Undertaker come out, and you're like, yeah, these guys got to fucking stop. <laughs> yeah, Undertaker just retired, though, recently. I don't know if you heard. Yeah, I mean, fuck, the guy's. 50 something years old and he's beat up yeah he had to man but he put on a classic at rest of the past wrestlemania with uh what's his name right aj styles yeah they had like that uh cinematic match the yeah. match. Yeah. I, didn't watch, I didn't watch it but i heard good things well at his age that's all he could pretty much do is work a cinematic match you know what i mean yeah for sure <laughs> but um i appreciate you taking the time to do this with me today kenny it was uh pleasure having you mike you keep up the good work man i like your style keep it up you know hope all good things come to you come your way and uh good luck in school graduate get your picture up on the wall fellow alumni (laughs) 
um, yeah, good luck. And yeah, reach out to me anytime you need me. All right. Thank you, man. Take care, All right, buddy. Later.